Well, uh, good morning again, and um, apologies, I forgot the chapel on the Freeth crew, didn't I? So I do apologise, but, um, but, and Nottingham as well, this, I didn't say Nottingham either, so yes, thank you for Nottingham. Yeah. Yes. So uh, welcome everybody. I'm, um, I'm not too good with farewells, um, as, um, uh, yes, I'm just not actually, and um, so, um, yeah, um, this isn't really a farewell preacher or anything like that. Um, these, these kind of last words are, are a conclusion to a series we've been doing here on um, culture, church culture. We've been having a look at a, a few things in church culture. Um, and this kind of finishes that off, but I guess it stands alone as a, there's a reminder in there for all of us uh, as well of this calling on our lives to be distinctive for Jesus, to be distinctive for Jesus, to be countercultural, to signpost people to the kingdom. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he put it like this. He says, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. That's quite, that's quite deep, quite, quite significant in just one sentence. Your life, our life, my life, your life, our life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. We've been looking at some key characteristics and behaviors that evidence healthy church culture, the environment, those instinctive values that we live out of, the ways of God's people that do that kind of thing, that, that signpost a different way. And so I want us to briefly think this morning about a culture of devotion and witness, devotion and witness. The backdrop for our Bible reading is, uh, which is from Acts 2, the backdrop is Pentecost. Um, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the Jesus followers, on the church. And there's a bit of a step change in things at this point, in the ordering of the world, really. And it's immediately apparent as Peter does a massive preach, an incredibly powerful message from Peter, and he explains to all those looking on. He explains um, who Jesus is. He explains what's going on to this listening crowd who are convicted. And in that moment, 3,000 people commit themselves to Jesus. Now that does merit a hallelujah, actually. Yeah, three, yeah, 3,000. I have to confess, that has not happened in my preaching, okay? I've not made it to that mark of 3,000, or 1,000 for that matter, but there we go. 3,000 um, baptized there and then, awesome. But here's the thing, suddenly, suddenly, Peter and all of those first Jesus followers, that, that, that group there, suddenly, they've got a challenge on their hands, they've got... 3,000 newbies, 3,000 new Christians to handle, to deal with, to disciple, or whatever. Where, where do you start? What do you do? What do you focus on? And what can we learn about this, this culture that develops? And so we're going to have our reading now from Acts chapter 2, and I think uh, Ian's got that uh, for us this morning. So if you've got your Bibles with you, if you want to open the page or switch them on or whatever you do, um, but um, Ian's going to read for us now. Thank you, Ian. <coughs> morning, everybody. Morning. <coughs> Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Ian. So this morning we um, we number round about 120, just over 120, I think, maybe about 130 odd this morning. Um, question for us: If it were us, how would we handle 3,000 converts? Okay, God brings them along, 3,000 converts. How do we handle that right here, right now? What a privilege! And it's a remarkable scene that Acts describes there. 120 so Jesus followers keeping a low profile until the Holy Spirit comes and then everything changes, energized by God's presence. Peter and all he, the other disciples there, 3,000 folks as part of the Jesus family. What do they do next? How are they going to go about receiving and including folks? Thing we, 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 we just think this is, this is too much. This is unreasonable. We're stretched to breaking point, and yet it happened. They handled it. They coped. What do discipleship basics look like in these foundational moments of the church? And folks, they look like this. Devotion and witness. Devotion and witness. Where there is genuine faith. There is devotion and witness. Devotion to Jesus. These 3,000 were there. They were all in. They were committed. There's devotion to one another. And there's witnessing to the grace of the cross before all peoples through this radical reordering of life and the values, the way these Jesus followers live. It is all about the up, the relationship with God. It's all about the in, the relationship with one another. And it's all about the out, the relationship with the community looking in. Devotion to to Jesus then. Yearning to know more of him wanting to hear as much as they possibly can about him, to get close to him, to discover him, to just, just, to, just to get near to this saviour who they discovered loves them so much. Going along to the apostles, the apostles to sit at their feet and listen to the teaching and the explanation. Wanting to hear what the apostles have got to share wanting to encounter Jesus at the cross through the breaking of bread, sharing communion together regularly, desiring to develop relationship with Jesus in prayer, praising him every day, we're told, these gatherings every day. They were hungry for more, devoted to Jesus. It's a nice check and challenge for where we're at in our spirituality, devotion to Jesus. And then there's this devotion to one another that's going on in these first days of the church. They are choosing to spend time together in big gatherings in the temple courts, in smaller gatherings at home. They're eating together. They're sharing life together. They're opening their homes to one another. They're getting close to one another. Status didn't come into this. They were free and slave, mingling together. And they were doing this, we're told, gladly and sincerely. There's not a sense of duty here. They want to do this. Devotion to Jesus, devotion to one another. And then all of this is lived out under the watchful gaze of the folks around 
There was nothing secret in those times. Your life was pretty much an open book to everybody else who was watching on. And this wider community absolutely knew that something was going on. Something remarkable was going on. There's no way anything of this scale could be hidden at all. It's out there. It's in the public domain. God is up to something, and these people have encountered him. And this community, watching this, watching this witness, watching this change of life, watching this faith, this community started to respond pretty quickly. They responded, we're told, with favor and with faith. Faith to the witness of lives changed by Jesus. And that equaled, yeah, even more believers. 3,000 was the starting point. There are more joining these gatherings in the temple courts, in the homes, breaking bread, praying, praising. It's amazing. It's fantastic. And for 2,000 years, we've been meeting together like this and just devoting ourselves to Jesus. Do not give up meeting together, devoting yourself to just discovering more of Jesus, committing to one another. Here in what we've just read, here is, is koinonia. It's a sense of oneness, a sense of fellowship and connection, a sense of togetherness, genuine devotion to one another through a shared Devotion to Jesus creates a whole different environment. It's one anothering, one anothering in a, this community. And frankly, in a community of this size, one anothering, looking after each other, looking out for each other is essential. And it begins in the church straight away, community. And we see here a reorientation of values, a reorientation of perspective, and it's evidenced in the attitude towards their possessions, the stuff that they've worked hard for. Wealth is now not to be grasped and gripped and possessed, but instead it's to be stewarded generously. There's been a real change of heart in this whole community stewarded generously in the service of the kingdom, in the service of Jesus. Things like time and talent and treasures, the, the trinity of possessions that we know so well, they all feel the pull of the Holy Spirit when lives are changed. They're handed over. How could the things that we hold dear not be drawn towards the common good, towards this, this ecclesia, this gathering, this holy community when God is at work and his spirit is changing lives. People have given themselves to Jesus and their possessions simply follow. That's how it works. There's joy, there's passion, there's expectation. It's all part of the tone of this culture of devotion and witness. And there's a sense of giving, giving of self and giving of self to others, to God, to others. Giving to the wider community. Giving that announces the reign of the Father's love through the Son in the presence of the Holy Spirit. A writer called uh, Willie Jennings, who I was reading about this, this passage, um, he says this. He says, people caught up in the love of God not only begin to give thanks for their daily bread, Lord's Prayer, but daily offered to God whatever they had that might speak of that gracious love to others. Chesterfield, let's... Let's allow the, the holy wind of God, the Holy Spirit, to blow through our structures, our settled ways of living and possessing. Let him have his way. The history books tell us that there's, uh, there was a letter 
uh, written in the second century to a guy called um, Diognetus. I think I've pronounced that right. A letter to Diognetus. And it described the Christian lifestyle like this. He, he writes and he says, um, they live in their own countries, but only as aliens. They have a share in everything as citizens and endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their fatherland, and yet for them, every fatherland is a foreign land. It is true that they are in the flesh, but they do not live according to the flesh. They busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, but in their own lives they go far beyond what the laws require. They are poor and yet they make others rich. Christians dwell in the world, but they're not of the world. They've been changed. That's you. That's me. Hallelujah. Praise God that he's changing us. Yeah? We want more of that, don't we? Good. That's okay then. Just checking. Just checking. Just to, to, to kind of wrap this up then, bring it into at land. Um, Alan will tease me about that one later. Culture is about cultivating something. It's about nurturing. It's about growing something. Just to use that farming, that gardening image. It's about nourishing and nurturing the kingdom way of living. And through this series, um, just as a bit of a recap, we've looked firstly at this culture of spiritual maturity from Ephesians 4. Unity, gifts, and a culture of spiritual maturity, of growing up in Christ. Developing a fullness of faith as opposed to just staying immature as, as, as Christian babies, if you like. Let's reach for the more that God has for each of us. Let's not stay babies. Let's reach for the, the spiritual maturity, the depth, the riches that Jesus would give to us. Let's grow up. Secondly, we looked at a culture of, of grace and we considered that that poor woman who'd been caught in adultery and dragged before the crowd and put in front of Jesus. And we noted that Jesus didn't pass judgment on her. That's what the crowd wanted him to do. He didn't pass judgment on her at all. He didn't play on things like shame and embarrassment. He didn't press those buttons. He was a safe place. A safe place compared to the judgmental mob that was around. And he invited repentance and he gave opportunity to change, for life to turn around, to travel in a different direction, to travel with Jesus, a safe place. We, we need to adopt this, this posture of embodied grace as Jesus did. Life's messy, it really is. Spirituality is, is messy. People are ashamed, people are embarrassed, they have questions, they have uncertainties, or they simply don't know Jesus. Our job is not to shame and embarrass them, but to explain and show that Jesus offers another way. Now is not the season of judgment, that's to come. Now is the season of grace. Let's offer grace. Just as we've received grace, let's invite others to partake of it. Thirdly, we looked at the culture of team and gifts, again from Ephesians 4 and those fivefold ministries. It says there, it was Jesus, it was Jesus who gave some of you to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. Five ministry gifts for the church, each kind of reflecting an element of Jesus' own ministry. A Jesus-shaped church ministering the way Jesus ministered. And it makes sense because Jesus gifts of himself 
to his people to equip them. Folks, we've all got gifts, giftings, we've all got abilities, God-given. And if every one of us serves in the role and ministry Jesus has created for us to do, from this place of humility, with gentleness and patience, in unity and not apart, then church will flourish. It'll be amazing. Don't you think? Yeah. I think so. Dive in. Enjoy. <laughs> Go deep. And then a culture of valuing others. We had a little look at the, uh, the lost sheep with uh, Alison and Rob's help. It was brilliant. And, um, and we discovered that it matters to God. It matters to God that just one man or woman, one boy or girl should waste his or her life. That matters to him. Someone cherished is missing from his family there's an empty chair at the table to say god cares for all mankind is absolutely true but these parables um, the lost parables in luke 15 show how he cares for us and he cares for us all one by one he knows you he knows your name he knows everything about you and he knows the names of all those folks out there and everything about them each one it's no consolation to the shepherd at all to tell him when one's gone missing that he's still got 99 left. That's no consolation at all for the shepherd. The most important sheep at any moment in the shepherd's mind is the one that needs him. The one that needs him. The one he's lost. We put our faith on show. We invite others to come and discover the Good Shepherd. And then finally, a culture of devotion and witness. Devote yourselves to Jesus. The more time you can set apart for him, the better. Devote yourselves to one another. Look after one another. Encourage one another's faith. Exhort one another on. And look out for your community. Put your faith on show to the world, the world around. Chesterfield, guard your culture, nurture your culture, dive deeply into the grace of Christ and all the resources that he offers you through his Holy Spirit who wants to travel alongside with you. Paraclete, the co-pilot, is in the chair next to you. Let's pray. Jesus, we just want to say to you this morning um, that we need you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us. Thank you for a love so huge, so high, so wide, so deep. We need your guidance in our lives. Thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit on your church. Give us that capacity to invite you into each and every corner of our lives, to hold nothing back, to give you everything, and to follow you. Jesus, we get excited about all that you do for us, for all that you're doing in the world, the kingdom that you're building. And as you invite us to, to play a part in that building, to walk with you, just give us the courage to step out in faith and walk with you on this great adventure of faith. For your glory, Lord. Amen.